Prime Minister Sira Wadi, Face the Nation. You're about to see Hussein Shaheed Sira Wadi, Prime Minister of Pakistan, Face the Nation with questions from veteran correspondents representing the nation's press. Jalmers Roberts, diplomatic correspondent for the Washington Post and Times Herald. Bill Downs of CBS News and John Madigan from the Washington Bureau of Newsweek. And now substituting for Stuart Nobins from CBS News and Public Affairs, the moderator of Face the Nation, George Herman. Insofar as Western policy is concerned, one nation forms the land bridge between the troubled Middle East and the potentially troublesome Far East. That nation is Pakistan, a Muslim republic which faces Iran and the Arab world on one frontier and Burma and the Asian world on the other. At the head of the pro-Western government of Pakistan is Prime Minister Hussein Shaheed Sarawardi, a lawyer with a background of working for labor organizations and a foreground of fondness for the broadest possible kind of democracy. He has a reputation for frank and unabashed speech, and we'll see about that now as we get our first question from Mr. Madigan. Mr. Prime Minister, what have you and President Eisenhower accomplished in your conferences that could not have been affected at the ambassadorial level or through meetings of our State Department with your foreign office? Well, I think personal contacts have their value, and uh, we understand something more about American doctrine and American politics by personal contacts. And I think that President Eisenhower and Secretary Dulles also understands more of my mind and what I propose to do. Well, Mr. Sarawati, the uh, communique makes no specific mention of military aid. Your nation is a bridge between CETO uh, and the Baghdad Pact. Did you get additional military aid? Well, I don't know, but it is obvious that all the time we are reviewing the, uh, our military requirements, Mr. Downs. The position really is that uh, we are not seeking military aid in such quantities as it may make it difficult for us to digest all the aid that we get. We want just enough military aid to uh, save us from aggression. You did ask, sir, while uh, speaking to the President and the Secretary for some additional military equipment, is that correct? Well, we have assessed. All that I can say is this, as we are doing, we are continually assessing our requirements. At the present moment, my view is that we have not received sufficient military aid. Well, the communique that you uh, issued uh, with the President jointly speaks of serious financial pressures on your government uh, due to maintaining your military forces, which are allied, of course, with American forces in uh, two specific uh, packs out there in your part of the world. Uh, what do you mean by that? What are those financial pressures and what are you asking us to help you do to relieve them? Well, Mr. Roberts, the position is that our revenue and our income is not sufficient to maintain our military uh, equipment at a proper standard. When I mean a proper standard, it is not sufficient to save us from aggression. And all that we want is that uh, America should come to our assistance to that extent that uh, we shall be able, without fear of being uh, attacked from any quarter, to carry on with our cooperative effort and our constructive effort. Mr. Prime Minister, speaking of aggression, the uh, Indians say that they fear an attack <coughs> from Pakistan in the area of Kashmir. Do you intend to use military force to enforce what you consider your rights in that area? Obviously not. We are not fools. The Indians are tremendously, very much stronger than we are. It was the Indians that moved their forces on the borders of Pakistan twice once in 1950, another in 1951. We never moved our forces at the borders against them. Mr. Prime Minister, you have just said in this communique with the President that you have uh, pledged to try to solve this Kashmir question with your Indian neighbor peacefully, yet in a speech which you made in your own parliament uh, not long before you came here, you said that you had reached in your approach to the United Nations 
our very last throw of the dice. We cannot continue to live under these conditions. You have been unable to solve this directly with the Indians. What do you mean by that? How, how are you going to resolve it? I'm afraid, Mr. Roberts, you've misunderstood me. I've said that uh, so far as our relationship with India is concerned and the Kashmir question, we have tried to resolve the question by mutual conversation and contacts, but uh, we have not reached any conclusion. Consequently, we have approached the United Nations now, and we expect that the United Nations would do justice. You feel, Mr. Prime Minister, that President Eisenhower is going to give you, through the United States, in the United Nations, strong backing to try and get the demands? Well, I am certain about it. If he doesn't do so, I shall be deeply disappointed, because I expect from him a sense of justice, that he will try and see that uh, the matters between us are adjusted. He has so said, and you have in the communique, that he hoped it would be solved on a just basis, and under United Nations uh, principles, I think, is the term that's used. Yes. What action expressly will be taken by the United States in the United Nations in relation to the Kashmir issue? Oh, I think, Mr. Madigan, that the uh, United States ought, in the Security Council, and later on in the General Assembly, if it is necessary for us to go to the General Assembly, to use its weight and its influence and its uh, persuasion to see that the other countries of the world also realize the justice of our case. You say that the United States ought to do that. Has the I President said that we will do that? Well, I expect that they will. He has said so? And if he has said so, well, I am sure that he will. Well, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, we in this country uh, are familiar with uh, fights over water. In Kashmir and the Ind Indus Valley, which uh, your country comprises, uh, the Indians have been threatening to build dams which would cut off uh, a large part of your irrigation water. Now, we have had range wars over this question in the West in the past, and even in the present, I think, over California and the rest of it. Would you go to war if India did build these dams and cut off your uh, livelihood that way? Oh, let us not talk about these hypothetical matters. I, I, don't, I cannot conceive that India will ever be so, uh, I would like the word, I mean, so barbarous as to stop the water from flowing down our rivers. Well, what is the solution this, to this thing? The, there are, as you know, six rivers. Most of them rise in Kashmir. One of the reasons why, therefore, the Kashmir is so important for us is this water, these waters, which irrigate our lands. They do not irrigate Indian lands. Now, what India has done is, it's not threatening, it is actually, it is building a dam today and it is threatening to cut off the waters of the three rivers for the purpose of irrigating some of its lands. Now, if it does so without replacement, it is obvious that we shall be starved out and person and people will die of thirst. Under those circumstances, I hope that contingency will never arise. You can well realize that rather than die in that manner, people will die fighting because that will be the very worst form of aggression. But I think that before any such situation can arise, those countries of the world that undertake and uh, have undertaken to ensure that peace exists and that matters between countries of our type are adjusted, will step in to see that India does not perform any such barbarous action. Mr. Prime Minister, that's at least a future contingency you're discussing. I'd like to ask you this about the Kashmir dispute with India. The Indians claim that the United Nations resolution in this question said that, first of all, you should pull your troops out of Kashmir, and that all the other steps in the UN resolution were contingent on that, including the idea of the plebiscite, and that you have never done that. What is Pakistan's answer to that charge. The Pakistan's answer to that charge is the United Nations resolution and the reaffirmation of that resolution not so long ago as January the 24th, 
19, or 23rd, 1957. After all, this matter was raised <coughs> by India before the Security Council, and this contention has been rejected. That is not the correct reading of the resolutions of the United Nations. These are nothing else but plausible uh, excuses that are put forward by Mr. Nehru for the purpose of giving a semblance uh, 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 some, some adequate specious reason for his intransigence. On this very show last Sunday, Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Nehru disagreed with you 100%. Well, I disagree with Mr. Nehru more than 100% of that oh. is possible. Mr. Prime Minister, can there be real peace between Pakistan and India until you settle or the religious question? When uh, the India was partitioned, there was probably one of the greatest bloodbaths in civilization's history that took place. Several million people were slaughtered for religious uh, reasons. Is there an answer to the dispute between the Hindu and the Muslim? That matter is closed. India was partitioned on that ground. There were uh, these tragedies that took place, particularly between the two wings of the Punjab, because passions were high. After that, we have settled down to work. There are about one-eighth of the population of India is Muslim, one-eighth of the population of Pakistan is non-Muslim. We are trying our level best to see that uh, justice is done to the minorities. So far as we are concerned, we haven't had a single riot since 1950 when Nehru and the late Mr. Ali Khan came to a certain agreement regarding the treatment of the minorities. In, uh, in India, I believe there have been as many as 402 riots from that time till now. Mr. Prime um, Minister, a few months ago when Mr. Nehru was here in the United States, one of our colleagues referred to him as the mystical man in the middle. He meant he was referring to Mr. Nehru's stand toward non-alignment and neutralism. What is your description of Mr. Nehru's position in the Cold War? Well, I think that Mr. Nehru himself does not understand his position. Mr. Nehru occasionally leans on one side, occasionally on the other. The result is he gets the best of both worlds, that is to his advantage, and I think he continues to uh, pursue that policy because up till now he has not been caught short on it. But you too, sir, up until a short time ago, uh, followed a policy of non-alignment. No, I don't think so. Well, you are... Oh, no. You are interpreted as saying up till 1953, uh, 54, yeah. not connecting yourself with either side. And I believe you have said recently that you have learned some things since that time which have attached you solidly to the West. Am I not correct? Yes, the position was that I, if I can cast my mind back, it was sometime in 1950 when I thought of the question of these defensive pacts and alliances and so on. Uh, but not had uh, been considered for some time in 1950 that I thought it desirable that we should remain aloof from the world conflict. Uh, and still, I would say this, that uh, the policy which I have laid down for my country is goodwill towards all and malice towards none. There's no reason why we should uh, start on a shining charger and uh, start tilting against windmills. The, uh, uh, in 1953 or 1954, it was not, I, I, I do not think I ever stated that we should not align ourselves with any countries. Mr. Prime Minister, but, you're... But, uh, one moment. Me. I, uh, at that moment, I had stated that I had not sufficient knowledge of the political situation or of our state of preparedness uh, and so on. Uh, because uh, the uh, government did not take either the country or the opposition into confidence. And, and uh, therefore I said, as I had not sufficient knowledge, I was not prepared to give a dictum as to what should be our policy. As I said that recently, I have come to know more about the situation, and I am perfectly satisfied that the only manner in which Pakistan can be saved from aggression and the security of the Middle East can be assured is through these defensive threats into which we have entered.
Mr. Prime Minister, some of the cynics say that the reason Pakistan has joined these pacts with the Western countries, especially the United States, has to do in part at least with reasons other than military ones, that it, they have to do with economic reasons, that in fact your budget is supported to some 40 percent by the United States. Is that correct? Well, our budget is supported to some extent, but that is not the reason why we have joined the United States. We were uh, uh, on, in, the same, in the same boat, as you may call it. We, are, we fought in the same manner on account of the very religious fundamental principles that we profess. Therefore, this has nothing whatsoever to do with the economic situation. Uh, after all, if, if the United Nations is assisting us, as it is assisting 40 other countries, that's an entirely different matter. But uh, we are not selling our independence, or sell our independence of thought, or in, even independence of action, except uh, for these economic reasons and for aid reasons. Well, Which, Mr. Prime Minister... Well, should the United States choose to cut it off, we shall still continue on the path that you have Is 40 percent a correct figure of the amount of your budget which comes by one means or another from a, in the form of American help? Well, I wouldn't... I, uh, no, I don't think so. I think uh, a great portion of the foreign exchange which is available to us for our development purposes that comes from the United States because most of our foreign exchange is committed to meeting our own defense requirements. Well, Mr. Prime Minister, you are a bridge between the Middle East, the uh, Southeast Asia, and just north of you, there's a big nation called China, Communist China, and you've been there recently, I believe. Yes, What sir. is Pakistan's relationships, and how do you feel about uh, this colossus north of you? Well, I've told you that uh, we, our policy is uh, not to have malice against anyone. And so long as China does not interfere with us, I see no reason why I should interfere with China. But uh, China has got a very important place in world politics. And uh, you have to wait. It is trying to reconstruct itself. Do you think that the United States should recognize China? Uh, that is a matter of policy for the United States, and I think that only recently your Secretary of State, Mr. Dulles, has given what he considers to be very adequate reasons why uh, China should not be recognized. Do you agree state. with him? Uh, to some extent, I must say. Do uh, you have has diplomatic relations? Behind it. They you, does your government have diplomatic relations with Peking or with the Formosa government? No, our uh, government has diplomatic relations with Peking government. Your communique, yours and President Eisenhower, spoke of exerting influence in the Middle East to solve the problem, their Israeli-Arab problem. What do you specifically mean? What type of influence and how would you exert it? Well, I think that Palestinian question or the Israeli problem has got to be solved if we are ever going to be certain about these in the Middle East. And I think that it is the duty of all persons of goodwill to do whatever they can in bringing about the What specifically can Pakistan or the United States do? Well, I think that they could bring the two parties together. They could try and reason with outside them. Outside the United Nations? Yes, outside the United Nations. In other words, you're calling upon the United States to act as an individual mediator in this problem? It could. How about Pakistan? Would you be willing to be a mediator in this problem? <coughs> yes, I think so. Well, there have been some uh, speculations, Mr. Prime Minister, that you have ambitions to lead the Muslim world, or at least to pull it together. Mr. Nasser also has similar ambitions. Uh, where do you stand in this uh, struggle for the Muslim world, if there is one? Well, I think there is no struggle. If Mr. Nasser has got ambitions, well, let him pursue his ambitions. I have no such ambitions. Mr. All that I've been wanting to do is to bring the Muslim world together so that they can sit down at the same table, discuss matters amongst themselves, all these disputes which exist between the member nations may be resolved, international with regard to international disputes, we may be able to put forward suggestions which may help to resolve them, and so far as leadership is concerned, 
My view definitely is that if any country desires to get the leadership of the Muslim world, then that combination, and namely the Muslim world coming together, is bound to fail. Mr. Prime Minister, how is Pakistan in a position to exert any influence in the Middle East conflict between the Arabs and the Israelis? When you have recently said of Israel, we have never recognized it and we shall never recognize it. You are entirely on one <coughs> side of that controversy, are you not? Well, I'm afraid that that is the position of Pakistan, because I think that the creation of Israel was wrong. But after all, there is Israel, and uh, everyone realizes that there must be an adjustment and an agreement between the Arab world, between the Arab nations that resent the existence of Israel and Israel itself. Now, an agreement of this nature connotes that they recognize the existence of Israel, that they recognize that uh, if there's an agreement between the two parties, then that one of the parties uh, does, is not exterminated. You would advise all the Muslim nations to accept Israel as a fact of life? Uh, I'm afraid there's no other alternative. But there's no reason why Pakistan should recognize its existence as, a, as something uh, that... Um, it's, a, it's a fact, it's a very unpleasant fact. Mr. Prime yes, Minister, uh, doesn't your discussion understand. here regarding China, Israel, uh, Egypt, all these countries, the United States, Russia, you say don't tilt at windmills, windmills, don't start a war, does this not place you a little bit in a position of uh, similar to Nehru's, of non-alignment, uh, like everybody? Oh no, no. On the other hand, we say this, that if there is aggression in respect of any of the countries with which we have agreed, it will be the duty of Pakistan to enter into the fray. Well, you're saying then that all these pacts are only defensive pacts. They are defensive And that no pacts. moral or economic pressure should be brought to bear on any of the parties in the communist sphere of the world. Well, I'm sure that that must also be the policy of the United States. Is it your policy? Not to have aggression. But is it your policy to bring other pressures to bear on these nations? Well, I... I Think, I, as I do not believe in their ideology, I think that we should try and see that they conform more to the things that we believe in. And uh, possibly there are internal pressures, as you can see, now visible in these countries, from which uh, one can uh, hope that there is going to be a change in the internal policy of well, Mr. Prime Minister. Excuse me, though, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, you personally are pushing for wide general elections in your own country, yet one of your neighbors to the south, another distinguished Muslim leader, Mr. Sukarno, has said that he thinks that the people of Asia are not yet ready for this broad kind of democracy. What is your answer to that? Well, Mr. Sukarno might speak for his country, but not for ours. I think that we are. I think that the British have given us sufficient background, Mr. Herman. They have uh, brought us up in that, uh, uh, in that atmosphere of democracy. If I may follow your line of thought, then, you do not feel that the Dutch people gave the Indonesian enough of that kind of background. I wouldn't like to go into the internal history of Indonesia. Well, Mr. And Prime Minister, not, do, you, do you, fear, you fear in your own country uh, an ideological invasion from the North? In other words, are, do you have a political threat of communism in, uh, in Pakistan? Well, uh, I must say that attempts have been made to infiltrate into our country and there has been a certain amount of spread of communism and unfortunately uh, communist countries themselves have not uh, uh, to that extent directly interfered in that or uh, have infiltrated but have uh, utilized the neutral, neutralist country. You're it's saying, are you, that, that, are you saying, sir, that th this communist threat of subversion is coming through the Indian Communist Party rather than centering, say, at the embassies of the Soviet Union and the Chinese Communists? Well, it's rather an embarrassing <laughs> question, you know. But uh, there is no question about it that, uh, that uh, there are Indian agents in our country that are uh, 
breach of communism in the United States. Well, Mr. Prime Minister, recently uh, our ally, Britain, uh, changed her mind, or at least diverted from our policy to liberalize her trade with Red China. Are you also going to liberalize your trade with Red China? Well, we have been trading with Red China to some extent. We have been selling it our cotton. We have been taking from them coal, which we need. I do not think that uh, our trade can be of such a nature as uh, can be considered to be of strategic value to China. At the start of the program, Mr. Prime Minister, you spoke of personal contacts with President Eisenhower, said they're good because it would dispel certain doubts. What doubts did you have concerning the United States or President Eisenhower? Did I use the you word? You didn't use the word doubt. No, you said, I didn't you said use the word doubt. Not clear in each other's minds what you were thinking or what the United States was thinking. No, on the other hand, possibly, we were more confirmed in our views as to our attitude. And, uh, Did you get everything you wanted while you were in Washington? Now, I didn't come here for anything. Got everything. That's something that's gone wrong with you all, to think that anybody who comes here, comes here with the idea of wanting something. I but surely coming here and talking to your leaders means that I can also contribute something in the matter of thought. That wasn't said in the term of derogation, Mr. Prime Minister. It meant that the legitimate desires that you might have. Um, well, we, we, uh, we all know the position and the, uh, and the uh, relationship that exists between us, and that's that. Surely we come here in order to uh, make friends and to know the people more and to have personal contacts, know something about the civilization and culture of your country. You can True. want a meeting of minds, is what you're saying, not merely material things. Well, I should uh, put it like that, Mr. Roberts. That's probably correct. Can I, I mean, it's, uh, it's true. I, I, I don't place myself on a par with the United States by any means. The United States is a very great country, and it has uh, given a certain a moral philosophy which did not exist before, namely a country helping other smaller countries, is, uh, is something which uh, people did not realize could be done. I'm afraid that's all the time we have, Mr. Prime Minister, and thank you very much for coming here to face the nation. Our thanks also to our panel of distinguished newsmen, Chalmers Roberts of the Washington Post and Times Herald, Bill Downs of CBS News, and John Madigan of Newsweek. This is George Herman. We invite you to join us again next week for another edition of Face the Nation. Our program today originated in Washington. CBS Television has presented Face the Nation, produced by Ted Ayers. Associated in production, Daryl Denzer. Directed by Jim Silman. Today on this CBS Public Affairs program, you saw the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Hussein Shaheed Sirawadi, Face the Nation. Al Stepler speaking. This is the CBS Television Network. ...to our assistance to that extent that uh, we shall be able, without fear of being uh, attacked from any quarter, to carry on with our cooperative effort and our constructive effort. Mr. Prime Minister, speaking of aggression, the uh, Indians say that they fear an attack <coughs> from Pakistan in the area of Kashmir. Do you intend to use military force to enforce what you consider your rights in that area? Obviously not. We are not fools. The Indians are tremendously, very much stronger than we are. It was the Indians that moved their forces on the borders of Pakistan twice. Once in 1950, another in 1951. We never moved our forces at their borders against them. Mr. Prime Minister, you have just said in this communique with the President that you have uh, pledged to try to solve this Kashmir question with your Indian neighbor. Specific mention of military aid. Your nation is a bridge between CETO uh, and the Baghdad Pact. Did you get additional military aid? Well, I don't know, but it is obvious that all the time we are reviewing the, uh, our military requirements, Mr. Downs. The position really is that uh, we are not seeking 
military aid in such quantities as it may make it difficult for us to digest all the aid that we get. We want just enough military aid to uh, save us from aggression. You did ask, sir, while uh, speaking to the President and the Secretary for some additional military equipment, is that correct? Well, we have assessed, all I can say is this, as we are doing, we are continually assessing our requirements. At the present moment, my view is that we have not... And the Asian world on the other. At the head of the pro-Western government of Pakistan is Prime Minister Hussein Shaheed Sarawardi, a lawyer with a background of working for labor organizations and a foreground of fondness for the broadest possible kind of democracy. He has a reputation for frank and unabashed speech, and we'll see about that now as we get our first question from Mr. Madigan. Mr. Prime Minister, what have you and President Eisenhower accomplished in your conferences that could not have been affected at the ambassadorial level or through meetings of our State Department with your foreign office? Well, I think personal contacts have their value, and uh, we understand something more about American doctrine and American politics by personal contact. And I think that President Eisenhower and Secretary Dulles also understands more of my mind and what I propose to do. Well, Mr. Sarawati, the uh, communique makes no sufficient military aid. Well, and the communique that you uh, issued uh, with the President jointly speaks of serious financial pressures on your government uh, due to maintaining your military forces, which are allied, of course, with American forces in uh, two specific uh, packs out there in your part of the world. Uh, what do you mean by that? What are those financial pressures, and what are you asking us to help you do to relieve them? Well, Mr. Roberts, the position is that our revenue and our income is not sufficient to maintain our military uh, equipment at a proper standard. When I mean a proper standard, it is not sufficient to save us from aggression. And all that we want is that uh, America should come to Prime Minister Sarah Wadi, face the nation. You're about to see Hussein Shaheed Sirawadi, Prime Minister of Pakistan, face the nation with questions from veteran correspondents representing the nation's press. Jalmers Roberts, diplomatic correspondent for the Washington Post and Times Herald. Bill Downs of CBS News. And John Madigan from the Washington Bureau of Newsweek. And now substituting for Stuart Nobins from CBS News and Public Affairs, the moderator of Face the Nation, George Herman. Insofar as Western policy is concerned, one nation forms the land bridge between the troubled Middle East and the potentially troublesome Far East. That nation is Pakistan, a Muslim republic which faces Iran and the Arab world on one frontier and Burma 